We know from Genesis 6-4 that Nephilim, or giants, were the products of human women and what Genesis calls the sons of God. The non-canonical book of Enoch calls them the watchers, and they were the fathers of the Nephilim. Either name, they were fallen angels. But who was the first woman to give birth to a Nephilim or be a bride of these fallen angels, to give birth to a hybrid? Can we know from the book of Genesis? Well, maybe. I think we can. In today's episode, we're going to look at a woman named Naama, one of the first women named in the whole Bible. Yet she isn't often discussed. In fact, she's like never discussed. But she is very critical to the ancient Hebrew history. And it seems likely she is the first bride of the sons of God or fallen angels, the first mother of the Nephilim. All of this took place during and prior to what the Bible terms the days of Noah, the days before the flood, the antediluvian period, to use a real fancy theological term. The title of this teaching tells you that it matters today, and the term days of Noah probably helps you understand why it matters. Jesus told his disciples in two places that the days before his return would be like the days of Noah. In fact, he said they'd be just like the days of Noah. So what happened then is pertinent to what's going to happen prior to Jesus' return. If there were hybrids then, it's likely there will be hybrids in the future. And this shouldn't be a surprise at all. The elites, the globalists, are looking forward to it. Yuval Noah Harari, the advisor and spokesperson of the World Economic Forum, has been promoting the creation of a new human species. In fact, his prediction is that there won't be a single human left in 100 years, that everyone will be a hybrid. To an atheist like Harari, he figures, oh, well, why not? Hybrids can be engineered to be faster, stronger, smarter, and maybe even to be immortal, to no longer die. Now, this could be a good thing, they think, but it also could be a very bad thing. <laughs> the Bible hints at these immortals in Revelation 9, 6. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it, but death will flee from them. This is impossible in today's world. Everyone can die. And sometimes it comes a lot quicker and easier than we would want it to. But no one has the ability to want to die and not be able to. So something very strange is going on at that point at the fifth trumpet for this to be the case. So this is a theory that the Bible supports at least indirectly through what we just mentioned. One thing we can say for sure though is that anyone who becomes a new species as Harari desires cannot be saved. Jesus, who is God, came to earth and became a man and died to save humans. His grace offers salvation to every human who repents and believes in him. His grace is not extended to other species, especially those who try and genetically improve on the image of God. Taking this type of genetic, quote, upgrade is eternal damnation. So why did God issue a cataclysmic flood that wiped out the entire human population except for eight people back in Noah's day? Primarily, we believe, to wipe out the hybrids that were polluting the human genome. God is patient with those who are simply spiritually unrepentant, but still human. He gives them time to repent. However, once someone has willingly become something other than the image of God, it's too late. So God's end-time cataclysmic judgment will wipe them out, just as his flood 4,500 years ago wiped the Nephilim out. Now, these future hybrids will most likely be scientifically altered through genetic engineering. However, in the days of Noah, the genome was changed through procreation. And this brings us back to our topic, back to Naama, the first likely mother of the Nephilim. We have a couple questions to answer. First, why did Satan come up with this plan in the first place? And second, why did any humans go along with it? <laughs> These are good questions that never get asked. Let's start with Satan's motivation. Why would Satan do this? Well, in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God, 
you're aware that Satan tempted Eve into sinning and eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve then offered Adam the fruit and he ate it. It was at that moment that the dominion of the earth was stripped from Adam and Eve and they were both cast out of the garden into a land that God cursed. The dominion was then given to Satan, but it was only temporary because God cursed him also. God issued a proclamation in Genesis 3.15 to the devil that one day a human child would be born, a savior who would redeem humanity and crush his head. Satan did not want his head crushed, so he began conceiving a plan to prevent that human child, the Messiah, from being born, from ever being born. Satan noticed it was a human child, so he figured if he could change the genome and there were no humans left, if he altered them genetically, there wouldn't be any human children. No human child, no crushing of his head, and he could keep the dominion of the earth for himself forever. So at Satan's suggestion, he sent a battalion of angels, 200 of them according to the book of Enoch, to the earth to corrupt the human gene pool. Notice Satan didn't do this himself. He sent his underlings to do it because he knew the punishment and he wanted to avoid that crafty Satan. So that is why Satan's angels undertook the scheme. And that is why Satan is not currently in the abyss, but free to roam about the earth. However, in the future, when Satan tempts mankind to become hybrids, he himself will be punished and will be cast and chained in the abyss, according to Revelation 20. But as of right now, he's free. A second subtle part of Satan's scheme was to undo God's declaration of marriage between a man and a woman. The union of one man and one woman together cleaved forever, allowing the reproduction and creation of a human child. This was God's plan. But Satan had an idea that was not God's plan, using angels. And Jesus confirmed that angels are not to marry or procreate in Matthew twenty-two thirty. Speaking of humans, he said, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven, marrying and giving in marriage. Did you notice that phrase? It mirrors the statement of Jesus about the days of Noah. Well, Jesus said, that in the days of Noah, people would be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Let's keep that in mind because it's very relevant to Naama. So who is this Naama? She is one of the few named women in the pre-flood era. Obviously, there were women, lots of them, but most were unnamed. Only four were named, and I find this very interesting. Why only four? There must have been a reason for that. Let's keep that in mind. Now, Eve was one of the four. The other three were all part of the same family. Again, this is very unusual and very interesting. Why these women? Well, Eve encountered a fallen angel, Satan, and committed a great sin by eating the fruit that was forbidden. Did these other three women also encounter fallen angels and also commit sin? Is that why they're named? We can't answer that definitively, but it's possible, if not likely. So who were these other women? Let's look at the passage. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the city after the name of his son Enoch. So Cain is the first city builder, if you didn't notice from that. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mahulajel, and Mahulajel fathered Methuselah, and Methuselah fathered Lamech. Genesis 4, 17 through 18. We're going to find out these women come from this genetic line, Cain's fallen line. At that same time, the Bible records two lines, one through Seth, that was one of Adam's children, and the other through Cain, also Adam's child. All of them came through Adam. The seventh from Adam on Seth's righteous line you may have heard of was Enoch, and the seventh from Adam on the fallen line was Lamech. And Lamech's daughter was this Naama. So Lamech was a contemporary of Enoch and possibly even a contemporary of Enoch's father, Jared. Since Seth was substantially younger than Cain, 
the generations were probably skewed just a little bit, you know, maybe by 100 years. So that places this family in historical context. So you're probably asking yourself, well, that's all interesting, but why is this important? Well, for two reasons. First, because we suspect Naama may have been the first mother of the Nephilim. And if that's true, it requires the fallen angels or watchers be on the earth in the days when Naama was alive. And in the book of Enoch, we learn the watchers descended to the earth in the days of Jared, Enoch's father. So, was that during the days of Lamach from Cain's line? Possibly, very possibly. Just as we said, they were probably contemporaries of each other. Second, it's important because what isn't recorded. After Enoch, Seth's righteous line continues for three more generations. The total time was about a thousand years. However, Cain's line abruptly ends there, a thousand years before the flood. Hmm. Naama's children are not named. Why is that? Well, one reason possibly is that Naama's children may have been the Nephilim. She may have been the first mother of the Nephilim, and since they aren't human, they weren't listed, they aren't part of Cain's line. Now, Naama's name means beautiful one or lovely one. Is this also a clue? In Genesis 6, 1, we learn that the sons of God, or as Enoch calls them, the watchers, were attracted to the daughters of humans because they were beautiful or lovely. And that's part of the reason why the angels married them. Beautiful Naama, beautiful daughters of men, it seems to fit. Another clue is that all the information were given about Naama's family. I mean, in a normal genealogy in scripture, you might have three generations in a single verse. For instance, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, etc., but when certain figures in biblical history receive more verses and a whole story is told about them, we need to stop, slow down, and take a closer look because there's something of significance there. Why are they telling us the story? And Naama's family have six verses devoted to them. And in those verses, what Naama's brothers did is very significant. We learn that they were quite an inventive family. And Lamech took two wives. So he was a bigamist. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So he invented farming. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. So he invented music. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron the inventor of metalwork. The sister of tubal came was Naama. There's, there's that woman. So what is the chance that only one family on the face of the earth would invent music, farming, and metalwork? All in one family, all in one generation. Might you think that they had some help in doing that, like fallen angel help? I don't see how any other explanation is possible. And that's why you follow this channel, because we present information you just don't get elsewhere. If you like this video so far, hit the like button, or better yet, like and subscribe. These two buttons send a signal to YouTube to send this video out to a wider audience and an audience who needs to see this. Now, returning to this family, in the non-canonical book of Enoch, we learn that being instructed by fallen angels is exactly the case. Fallen angels brought technology to men. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth. That's what was taught to Balkane, by the way. And the art of working them in bracelets and ornaments and antimony and tinctures. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Semiazaz taught enchantments. Baraqual taught astrology. Kokabel, the constellation. Ezequel, the knowledge of the clouds. Araquel, the sign of the earth. 
Shamsiel, the signs of the sun, and Sariel, the course of the moon. That's the entire chapter of Enoch 8. In addition to the teaching of technology, did you notice that the majority of the fallen angels actually taught occult practices? So it was definitely evil instruction. So this one family, Lamech's family, had an intimate relationship with fallen angels, possibly giving their daughter in marriage to one of these interdimensional beings. This brings us back to Jesus' comments that the days of Noah included marrying and giving in marriage. Did Naama's dad and mothers give her in marriage? And was this happening with other fallen angels all over the world? I would say yes. Was there a trade-off in this giving in marriage? We give you our daughter, you give us technology. Well, to me, it sure seems like that. So what kind of person was Naama's dad? He was a violent sinner. And because of this, he and his family were ideal targets for the fallen angels. Who better to target for something like this than someone who has no respect for God and no relationship with him? This led Lamech to being willing to enter into a transaction with the fallen angels in our opinion. Like we said, his name was Lamech. He had two wives. He was the first man in the Bible so listed, so he was the first bigamist against God's law of marriage, of one man, one woman, and he was a murderer. Here's what it said to his wives about that event. Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man. The word here means pierced, like with a metal weapon, maybe a weapon that Tubal Cain, his son, made for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's vengeance is sevenfold, Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Genesis 23 through 24. The 70 times 7 phrase parallels God's words in Leviticus 26, where four 7 times 70 years were punishment given to Israel, 1960 years that happened because of the Jews' lack of faith. This vengeance is the Lord's and will continue, we believe, until 2030, as we explained in this previous video. It also parallels Daniel's 70 weeks, which is also a 70 times 7 time period. Not of vengeance, but of grace. And then there's the parallel with what Jesus and Peter said about forgiveness where Peter asked if he should forgive seven times, and Jesus responded, not seven times, but seven times 70, which is a reference, of course, to the 70 weeks prophecy that we're to forgive up until the end of the 70 weeks. So this time period is for vengeance on the one side, Cain's side, and for forgiveness and grace among God's people. That's very interesting. But getting back to Naama, it appears her dad and possibly her mothers were the ones who gave her to the fallen angels. And we're guessing that it was a transaction of sorts. Here's our daughter, teach us things. And as we stated before, Cain's fallen line ends with Naama, even though Seth's righteous line extends a thousand years more. How will the days before the return of Jesus parallel this? Well, people won't be willing to become hybrids if there isn't something in it for them, there will be a transaction of sorts. They will likely feel they will be stronger, smarter, maybe immortal, and maybe it's the part of the mark of the beast and it's the only way they're going to eat. So it will likely be a transaction just as in Noah's day. And nearly the entire world will go along with this as in Noah's day. Only eight people escaped in the ark. In Matthew 24, 22, Jesus said, and except those days be cut short, there should no flesh be saved. Jesus didn't say life or people. He said flesh. No human flesh would be saved. Now, people have looked at that and said, wow, Jesus said that in a very strange way. He must have been talking about life. He couldn't have been talking about the human flesh or the human body. But if it's talking about human flesh versus hybrid flesh, that no humans would be left, like Yuval Harari says, well, then it makes much more sense. So Jesus was saying, almost everyone will be hybrids before he comes. 
And the ones who refuse, of course, to become hybrids will likely be executed by the Antichrist. It's a whole different look at the end times based on what happened in the days of Noah. And where will this technology of making hybrids come from? Likely from fallen angels who are cast out of heaven to the earth. Again, the angels will be responsible. Will interbreeding happen again? Well, probably not because that is a very slow process that only affects the progeny. But scientific splicing and adding to the genome can affect every living human being and in a very short time. Our guess is that is why the angels will try to corrupt the genome that way. But why do this? Does Satan actually think he can win against God? Click right here to discover that yes, Satan thinks he will win. And as you keep watching, you'll find out why. Till then, this is Nelson and I'll see you there.